Uh, welcome to this Innovasis Science Talk. So this is an arena for dialogue and debate between academia, private companies, the public sector and civil society. It is a place for researchers and professionals to bridge science and practice. So the topic today, that is something most people have in, we could say an intimate relationship with. Um, and it also turned out to be a somewhat more controversial topic than we had expected. Or maybe we are a bit to blame because we picked a controversial title. So the topic today is wood log burning. And uh, the, uh, so most people here will have warm, positive memories in front of their fireplace. However, for some people, especially those with uh, underlying lung conditions, the small particles from wood log burning and other sources can lead to, to health problems. So today we will explore the science behind this. Uh, we wanted also Stavanger municipality to join, but unfortunately they couldn't. But I think we still have a very competent panel. We have UAS on board, we have NILU, we have uh, Sintef, and we also have UATUL and NOSC Baume to represent the industry. So today we asked a controversial question. How dangerous is the wood burner for our health? And what should we do about it? Um, and for you that are listening in, uh, please feel free to write your question in the chat. Uh, we don't uh, open up for any questions after the talks, but we'll save them for the end. And the program today is that we will first have three science talks from uh, Harald, Susanna and Eivind. Then we will have um, uh, some five minute introductions to five minute introductions from the additional panelists. Uh, before we go into the discussion. So with that, I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, which is professor at UIS, Harald Östvik. In many ways, he kicked off this debate with a piece in the newspaper Stavanger Aftenblad, where he wrote a piece claiming that the health risk linked to woodlog burning is significantly downplayed and that further restrictions should be put. Uh, on wood log burning. And to give his brief background, he is a professor in city planning at the University of Stavanger. His field of speciality is sustainability, where solar energy plays a central role. In addition to papers and articles, uh, Rustvik has written 10 books and been a co-author of an equal number. Among the topics he has covered is air pollution and wood burning from an urban life perspective. So with that, I would like to welcome Harald to give his talk. Thank you, everybody. And I'm sharing my screen now. I guess you can see the full screen, right? Yes, this works. OK, great. Thanks for organizing this. Uh, and thanks for my, to my um, co-talkers, uh, uh, presenters, uh, and the panel for turning up. This is a uh, a good mix of people, which I, I really look forward to. So um, log burning, uh, I'm going to cover this broadly and based on the impact on health and urban life, or what I like to call the real cost. And the quality of life in cities uh, have always been threatened by air pollution in developing countries and in industrialized countries. And as you see from this uh, little presentation here, uh, there are cities that um, have uh, worse conditions than us, but uh, through history, this has also improved a lot and the conditions today are pretty, pretty good. My interest is this is in, in this is basically also because I've lived in many of these places and worked in many of these places, actually all of the places you see here and many more. And I was also a professor in Bergen for 10 years, so I know what Bergen is struggling with in terms of log burning. So um, the global challenge here first, um, probably half a million Europeans die early every year due to uh, particles in the air, uh, pollution. And a lot of that is uh, log burning. Uh, Three billion people still use wood and cow dung for cooking. This is of course a developing country issue. It's not a Norwegian issue. But the 
understanding that air pollution will create problems. It will lead possibly to mass migration. And this is an issue which the UN and others are looking at. Now, for me as an urban planner, from the urban perspective and its regulations, the UN has a Human Cities Act of 2025, aiming at uh, making cities clean, clean air, clean water, access to greenery. And also, when you look at the concept of universal design, it aims at securing access for all, like if you sit in a wheelchair, as well as if you have breathing challenges. These are the international regulations we need to adhere to. Occasionally, some cities in Norway even are the most polluted in Europe. And in 2015, Norway was sentenced for poor air quality in the EFTA court. So this is not just something happening in developing countries or in the um, uh, other countries than Norway. I had the pleasure of um, supervising a massive thesis last year, domestic wood burning in Norway. And the findings there from questionnaires, I think there were 1500 people answering, is that people have very little knowledge about the issue of uh, log burning and how dangerous it actually can be, especially if you do it wrong. Uh, and this lack of knowledge is a problem which also municipalities will have to take seriously. The question I'm posing and which I post through my article here, as you see on the left in Stavangafla, is why are media and municipalities blaming traffic most of the time when actually log burning in the winter represents 60% of the particle emissions PM 2.5? Why is this happening? As you see at the bottom here, the on the right side, this is over three days at the a residential area of Oland with no traffic, no true traffic. And you see it peaks in the morning when people are in their home offices and it peaks in the evening between 10 and midnight. And the level is 90 micrograms per cubic meter. And it's a residential area, as I said, no traffic. For the first time in modern Stavanger, his, uh, Stavanger uh, municipality's history, a head of health warned the population against dangerous air, mainly from log burning. He warned people not to go out. This is just a couple of weeks ago. And a few days later, he resigned and left Stavanger. He is now health uh, chief in Bergen. He warned because all the monitoring stations in Stavanger showed red as you see on the left. And this is part of the challenge. People are surprised that this is actually log, a log uh, issue. Now, problem number one here is romanticism. The real issue, health damage, has been covered by a veil, a slur, hygge, the coziness. So let's remind each other that also cigars and cigarettes were very cozy at the time. Now we know more. Problem two is there is a huge industry around the Nordic concept of hygge. It's publishers, it's log burners, it's manufacturers, log choppers and sellers. And new log burners are sold as clean burners. But then again, let's remind each other of the filters on cigarettes. It didn't make them really clean. So Jötul, who will get a chance here to counterbalance me, of course, uh, has an annual turnover of 1 billion Norwegian crowns. And in addition, there's a big industry in addition to that. But they have a lot of hygge blogs, um, you know, selling this nice concept of wood burning that we all like. Problem three is people are burning a lot of stuff. They are using the log burners as waste bins occasionally. We have absolutely no control of the emissions. Sintef has control in their laboratories of what they put in the burners. We don't have control of people's log burners. Problem four is that more people work from home. And as I just said, you see from the peaks here that there, something has changed um, after we started working from home. 
Problem five is that we are defending log burning basically because we say that it has been, we agree that it has been internationally agreed that wood burning is climate neutral, but that might be questioned in the future. This shows how logs or trees rather are catching CO2. The trees age is here and the, the stored CO2 is here. It catches most in, in middle age. Of course, when you take that log and burn it, you release the CO2 again, so it's neutral. But if we didn't burn it, you could store it and use it for other purposes. And I could come back to that, for example, building. Problem six is that indoor air is sometimes as bad as outdoor, just like in some cars. There's a lot of studies from car indoor air. So it's not just something which happens to your neighbor. It's also something that happens to yourself inside the building. Problem seven is the lack of proportionality. Early deaths during 12 months in Norway, the figures are like this. 95 from traffic, COVID-19 pandemic so far, one year, 590. Pneumonia, 1,500. This year, none. Log burning, 1,400, maybe 1,200, maybe 2,000. We don't know exactly. The action to these different items have been tremendous for roads, for COVID, for vaccination, for pneumonia, but with log burning doesn't exist, it's laid back, it's the long-term view, let's shift the log burners in due time. The log industry's arguments for log burning is of course that the Norwegian grid has limitations in case it breaks down log burning will save lives. Well, the counter arguments could, for example, be burning logs does not seem very smart in a smart age. Power cuts here happens rarely. And if log burners are supposed to be for rare emergency, why use them every winter's day if it's an emergency? Electrification means more solar, wind, and heat pumps. Grid companies, they should upgrade their grids with battery banks and the linking between grid and local energy production and car batteries will in the future solve this. Now, how can we then, with so many different interests and science and science that some people don't trust, find a way forward? in the short term and the long term. I'm going to conclude by showing some possibilities for short term and long, long term. The short term, I'd say, would be from now until December 2021 this year. Since we are absolutely not learning from mistakes, since the removal of bad burners is too slow, authorities should act. And number one, I would propose that you ban types of log burners and open fireplaces that are the really bad ones. Sintef has a list of them and they know exactly which are the worst. The antiquarian and the cackle burners are not too bad. The new ones are excellent. The problem is probably those made from 1960 to 1990. Maybe Yertel can say something about this also because they delivered many of them. Second, Feyerwesner, the plumberer, they closes, they should close the bad ones, like bad cars are banned from EU controls. They visit the homes regularly, they know where the bad burners are. Number three, we should intensify the installation and the use of heat pumps. Solar walls, roofs, windows, and other thermal and electric energy sources as well as battery banks and storage can help improve the grid capacity. And make a note of this and look out your window wherever you are. When it's cold, when it's really cold, like it's been in Stavanger now for almost two months with minus five, minus 10 every night, it is normally sunny absolutely every day. There's no wind. It is still, that's why we smell the log burning. And in the smart world, the response to that should be building integrated solar PV, net zero energy buildings, positive energy districts and energy fish efficiency, not only burning of logs. 
Now, the long term, finally, from now, it could be like a five year plan. Intensify the removal of bad log burners. Teach people to burn correctly because they don't. Teach people not to use the burner as a waste bin. Teach people to ventilate their homes properly. And that's also very important. Secondly, upgrade and safeguard the electricity grid, improve the hydro energy system through energy efficiency to get more out of it. And three, make area efficient housing with heated crisis rooms. Learn from how the birds lower the temperature and everything apart from the brain in order to survive in those winter nights we see now. Climate change might make this compulsory. We might have to area efficiency the rooms we live in so we cannot heat everybody in extreme cases if the grid is at stake and if the health is at stake. At stake. So finally, timber is a great resource. I'm for it, but why burn it when it can be used for a lot of other very interesting purposes? 10 minutes, thanks. Yes, that was one minute over, but thank you. Sorry. It was pretty close. So uh, I think we'll just jump directly to the next uh, uh, speaker. So if you could end your sharing and Susanna will share next. And while she gets ready, I'll just briefly introduce you to Susanna. So uh, Dr. Susanna Lopez Aparicio works as senior researcher at NILU the Norwegian Institute for Air Research. Her main interest is in greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutant emission estimates, modeling and sustainable urban development. Dr. Lupus leads a group on emissions at NILU, focusing on the development of high resource, uh, high resolution emis emission models based on bottom up approaches. In the last years, the group have developed models for emissions from residential wood combustion and aviation emissions. And are currently, they are developing a model for emissions in building and construction. So welcome to you, Susanna, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you very much. I assume that everybody see the presentation in full screen. Not full screen, not full screen. Uh, sorry, the two screen. Uh... Let me see. Mm. Yeah, I have the problem of the two screens. Sorry for this. Um, can you inform me about mm, how yes. do you see? It's full no, screen it now. Yeah, but you just need to make full screen as well. Because... Let's see. Yeah, I should. Um, sorry. Having two screens make this. Um, let me see. Sorry for the delay. And looks that we tested before, but um, let me see. And in the meantime, I can just remind people, so if they have questions, just feel free to put them in the chat and try also to keep your questions brief. But Susanna, it, it worked rather well when you had the small ones on the left side, we, we can see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Was... then uh, if you inform him how the situation is now, I think it's yeah. okay now? Yeah, this worked well. Okay. Okay, sorry for the delay. I'm gonna give a, a very a brief uh, 10 minutes overview of wood burning emissions in Norway, focusing very much on urban scale. And uh, the intention is to show the complexity of uh, this problem. Uh, I like to, um, to start with these figures. In Norway, we have approximately uh, 2.5 million apartment and houses. And we have also a 2.1 million fireplace and wood stove. According to Statistic Norway, uh, residential wood combustion is the second largest heating source after electricity. This uh, show a uh, very large intensity uh, activity. That means uh, high emissions. Uh, we tend to talk about PM 2.5, but it's important to remind everybody that uh, wood burning emits a quite range of compounds that are relevant for air pollution, uh, human health, but also for climate change. If we look at the, um, the situation in Norway comparing our neighboring uh, countries, here we, we see emissions of uh, PM 2.5 in Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. 
are, are officially submitted to the Convention of Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution. We can see emissions, uh, the relative contribution from all the sources, and residential heating is the one that is represented in uh, yellow or light orange. So as you can see, in most of the countries, the relative contribution is above 50% to PM2.5 emissions. We tend to compare with uh, uh, road traffic, and here road traffic is the, the charge represented in brown. And as you can see, when we talk about PM2.5 emissions, residential heating is the, is the biggest sector. But how does it look like in absolute values here? We can see the four countries uh, and how emissions from residential heating has evolved since 1990 to 2018. On the top, we are the winners. We have the highest emissions from residential heating. But we can observe that in Norway, as for example in Sweden, emission has been reduced over time. Whereas, for example, in Finland and Denmark, they appear to be approximately constant or with a slightly increased uh, trend. In Norway, this uh, reduction in residential heating is due to two main factors. On the top, we see all the fuels that are used for residential heating and uh, the use of wood, that is the dash light line, has been reduced, but also other fuels. Some of them phase out like solid fuels, but we observe a decrease in the consumption of all fuels used for residential heating. And also the work that we, uh, we did a couple of years ago, we evaluate the emission factor weighted for the whole country and for specific uh, municipalities. And in every case, we observe that there is a continuous um, decrease in the emission factor over time. And this means that there is a continuous introduction of new technologies. But yeah, I have shown emission uh, from residential boot combustion in Norway at national level. But what is important to emphasize is that it is uh, when we talk about boot burning, what is important is what it happens at local scale. For example, when we calculate emissions, we need to know the boot consumption that occur per different type of technology. We use in our, ca in our case, a statistic in Norway as uh, official information. Um, and in the case of uh, technology, in Norway, we consider the same that official reporting. We have three types, open fireplace and a stove produced before 1998 and after 1998. So knowing the boot consumption per technology, then we need to know the emission factor also per technology, in which case we use also uh, official emission factor that in this case are developed by Sintef, uh, by the colleagues there. Uh, Celia School et al. 2017. But when we work at urban scale, we need to know other variables and it's when emissions happen and also where, as the difference in the, in the urban environment can be important. To illustrate these uh, differences, I took the work that we did last year concerning uh, boot burning in residential areas, but also in hitters. As you can see on the left is residential areas. We observe uh, PM2.5 emission intensity, and the biggest values are, are obtained around Oslo Fjord. And then you can see the biggest cities in Norway as hotspot. When we talk, for example, about boot burning in, <coughs> sorry, in uh, cabins, you can see that the spatial distribution is different. It's more obviously spread in the geography because uh, the cabins are more spread in that way. When we talk about time variation, we use uh, uh, meteorological information, outdoor uh, temperature, uh, to distribute emissions over the year, over the week, and in the different days. In that way, you can see in when we have an intense activity in winter time, goes to zero during summer, and then afterward increase again towards Christmas, Christmas time. During the, for the distribution during the day, we use uh, information from a statistic Norway, so we distribute emission differently during working days and during weekend as the activity may change. Although it's important to say that now in COVID time, we cannot use this, uh, this time variation during the week. So we use this kind of uh, uh, information and different type of uh, databases. For example, we use uh, a fire department database in Norway. We have over 1 million points. We use uh, information from Fin.no on the type of uh, heating technology per house or per apartment. 
we use uh, energy demand based on ANOVA database, and the intention at the end is to produce emissions at the highest possible resolution that in our case is 250 meters. And this we do it because emissions is essential input data for modeling that will give us an answer regarding pollution levels and how many people is exposed, for example, to dangerous levels. And here I took an example, it's a work that we did uh, several years ago, although we published uh, last year. We compare four different urban areas in the Nordic uh, uh, countries, Humea, Helsinki, Copenhagen and Oslo. In this figure, we have PM2.5 uh, levels, and the highest levels, for example, in Copenhagen and in Oslo are uh, on those areas in where we have the highest population density, what may, yeah, may be a, a, a risk for the people living there. But how much of this pollution is due to wood burning? Based on our modeling activities, we obtain that, for example, in the case of Oslo, we even have to develop a new color scale because the contribution from residential wood combustion was even higher than 45%, especially in the areas of uh, Lurensku and Oslo downtown. Another investigation that we have done has been uh, how the introduction of new technologies may affect air pollution. As I said before, in Norway, we use uh, uh, two types of stove produced before or after 1998. So we are considering in the official emission reporting that all the stove after 1998 are kind of the same. So we did an exercise to, to evaluate first, that is the red line, what will happen if there is a continuous introduction of new and better and better technology until today emission factors that uh, are claimed by the producer, 5.5. And the second one, emission factor established by ECO Directive, that is the yellow line. We took the emission factor for the meteorological year, and when we did the model and compare with the baseline, we get an improvement in air quality of 5 or 9% on average, or 13 or 21 in punctual areas of the city. So the modeling exercise, it shows a very promising result. However, when we compare with measurement data in Oslo over the long time series, we see that effectively there is a reduction in PM2.5. However, when we compare during winter, a heating season that is a bit larger than winter, a non-heating season, we observe that the reduction in PM2.5 is quite similar between winter and non-heating season, or even a slightly larger during summer, what means that the the, the reason for this reduction in PM2.5 is not wood burning, but it, there is another source that is active the whole year, most probably uh, traffic. This work was done as part of an evaluation of the stove exchange program. And one interesting result that we observe is that in many municipalities, we get reductions on emission from wood burning. However, when we compare municipalities with and without a uh, subsidy, we don't see systematic differences. Even in Oslo, in where we had the longest uh, stove exchange program over 20 years, the reduction was very low. When we evaluate wood consumption, we obtain that in, there has been a reduction in wood consumption. However, in Oslo was the lowest and no systematic difference between uh, municipalities with and without subsidy. It is important to highlight that uh, wood consumption and emission are also affected by human factor. We have heard before about the HIG factor, uh, how people operate the, the uh, stove installations. There is documented rebound effect when people change to other energy heating technologies. So there is many factors that need to be uh, considered and, uh, and they are very uncertain. And to finalize, just some uh, home message. It is important to remind that residential wood combustion is the main source of PM2.5 emissions, but it is important at urban scale. And in this case, we need to know with very high resolution when the emissions are happening and where, because the quality of emission inventories is a key factor for mo uh, modeling exercise that allow us to investigate future mit mitigation measures to reduce the environmental impact. And to finalize, it is important that when we talk about measure, uh, residential wood combustion is a problem when affects local air pollution. 
and this needs to be targeted only in areas with high population density and uh, especially in areas that are affected by meteorological conditions in winter that do not favor dispersion as it has been commented before as well low temperature no wind that enhance stagnation and with this i finish my presentation thanks thank you so much for your presentation susanna then we'll just jump directly to Eivind Skyberg from Sintef. And while he prepares, I'll read his introduction. So Eivind Skyberg finished his PhD at the Norwegian Institute of Technology in 1997. The thesis was entitled Theoretical and Experimental Studies on Emissions from Wood Combustion. He is now a research scientist at Sintef Energy Research. He has a broad background in heat engineering and thermochemical biomass conversion processes in general. Uh, his main research topics are emission formation and reduction in combustion. He has been the Norwegian member of the EEA Bioenergy Task 32 since 19, 1998, representing the Norwegian University of Science and Technology until 2007 and now Sintef Energy Research. So with that, I would like to welcome Evan Skyberg to give his talk. Thank you. I think you had a little bit wrong or old information. So I'm chief scientist at uh, Sintef within the stationary binary area. Uh, Sintef is an independent and non-profit applied research organization with more than 2,000 employees. <clears throat> Short overview of the presentation. So I will give an introduction and uh, say a little bit about history and status, uh, technology improvement potential, uh, further research needs, and then also how you as the user can reduce emissions from wood stores. A little bit uh, different numbers compared to what was presented before. So the wood store stock in Norway, uh, according to Norsk Varme, uh, is uh, 3.5 million wood log combustion appliances, 2.5 million stores, 1.1 million old stores and then about 1 million fireplaces. So emissions from wood log conversion in stores and fireplaces, it can be a health concern and that's mainly due to many old uh, stores uh, still needing replacement with a clean burning one uh, due to wrong operation. It's in areas with high population and wood store density. It's typically cities and it's also at special atmospheric and topographic uh, conditions. <clears throat> And it's not only about technology. It's about the fuel. You need the right fuel quality. It's about humans, which is a very decisive uh, factor. Uh, and in, in addition, you need good technology. So it's the stove, it's the building, it's the chimney, and there are also atmospheric conditions influencing uh, actual pollution levels in the air. Wood stores uh, operate with a batch combustion process. Uh, so it's not a continuous uh, combustion process as in pellet stores. So you will have a transient heat production profile. This also means that you have a transient heat release profile uh, into the room. Uh, you have storage in the walls and then uh, let's say a dampened heat release profile into the room. Many key aspects and challenges are connected to uh, uh, load conversion in stoves. Uh, it's the fuel itself, of course. It's the stove, the building, and the operator. I will not go into details, but there are many aspects to take uh, into consideration. It's not only about uh, emissions. It's also about uh, energetic performance and improving that. And there are many factors uh, influencing that, as the chimney inlet temperature, excess air ratio, moisture content. So you have the stove thermal efficiency, and you have the stove combustion efficiency. And then you will have a total efficiency from that. This is wood for firing in the old days. Uh, with high heating demands, uh, you have stoves that uh, looks uh, rather nice, but with poor poor uh, performance. This is wood firing today, uh, reduced to low heating demands in new types of buildings, improved insulation and so on. Uh, these wood stores, they also look nice. They have a large flame picture and they also have a very high performance. These are <clears throat> investigations carried out in the early 90s. Uh, in 1993, a paper was published uh, comparing uh, actually a lab stove, which then had staged air combustion. And this is where a very important principle of new wood stoves. 
it was compared to traditional stoves and an open fireplace and also a stove with a catalytic afterburner. Uh, very low emission levels with stage air combustion, very high emission levels with traditional stoves and even higher for uh, uh, the, the fireplace. So this is, uh, let's say, the, the evolution, it's stage air combustion. All new stoves uh, in the market, they have this combustion principle. It's rather easy instead of uh, letting the air in through one uh, uh, one place, you have a distribution between primary air and secondary air. So you have devil utilization of the wood, and then you have secondary air coming in with high speed, uh, giving a high intensity gas phase combustion. And you can also see, for example, blue flames coming, uh, or the flames have a blue color if it's really good. So uh, this is the revolution, and it has taken the emission levels down very much. And then you have an evolution uh, from 1998 until now, uh, where you are optimizing this uh, stage air combustion principle. Also optimizing, for example, the use of windows flushing air. So you get the blue flames even closer to the wood logs. And this is the evolution or the particle emission levels for the new stoves. So the emission levels for the new stoves, they have been cut in half according to tests at Sintif. Here. And according to tests in Denmark at the Danish Technological Institute, more than in half. So these are the real weighted emission levels according to the Norwegian type approval testing method. When you look at part load operation of all stores and nominal load operation of uh, new stores, you see a, a very big difference in emission levels. Take one example, the fine particles, PM2.5. It's a factor of 15 higher emission levels at part load operation in all stores compared to new stores at nominal load. This is very important. And to, to do this, you need advanced technology, and this exists today. And you need to operate the stove correctly. And this is relatively easy to learn. If you look at the energetic performance, this has also increased. And the old stoves are down here. So all these are new stoves, the blue dots. If you look at the future, you can anticipate even more reduced emission levels with automatic control and with new designs based on also a modeling and simulation to optimize the stores. These are the old stores at choke their supply, so low load. So the ultimate store, it uh, takes a lot of science, experiments, testing, development to actually come to this point where you have stores that operate so well as the new stores do today with quite low emission levels. So we are close to what is uh, optimum, but of course, still possible to improve them even further. And you can also apply, for example, secondary measures to take emissions further down. So the way forward as experiments, simulations, analysis, development, innovations, and then new products. So taking the efficiencies up, taking the thermal comfort up, the user comfort up, and the emissions down. So we will start a new project at Sintef and enter new in Trondheim, uh, dealing with the, the further development of wood stores and looking at also the whole value chain. So this project is called Sustainable Wood Stores through store building integration and value chain optimization. And this will start uh, this year and it will last for four years. So we'll take this research even further. And you need to operate the stock correctly. So there's a lot of information available when it comes to operation of wood stores. So it has to do with operation during ignition. If you do it right, you can reduce the emissions with 80%. It has to do with uh, operation at uh, ordinary operation. So after the ignition period, and if you operate at nominal load, you can also reduce with 80%. 
So there is, a, let's say, a procedure for how to operate the stall. And this you can look at later, but if you follow such a procedure, the chance that emission levels will go down is very high. So let me conclude. Wood stalls, they are very important in Norway and many other countries. They are the most important renewable heat provider for heating of dwellings in Norway after hydroelectricity. They provide energy security and relieve the electricity grid in periods of cold weather. They represent a formidable peak heating effect. It's about a third of the hydroelectricity effect in Norway. Uh, the virtual technology today is advanced with much reduced emissions and is continuously improving, as you have seen. A lot of effort has been put into research and development and through many years to achieve this. And this is continuing. And it's also an increased focus on sustainability through the whole value chain. So old wood stores, they should be replaced. They use an out outdated combustion principle. They are not good enough. The wood store operator, that is you, can much contribute to further emission reduction through correct stove operation. So that's using the right fuel, not any waste as mentioned before, and operating the stove according to the instructions from the wood store producer. Further info, you can find a lot of info and also at the web pages and in publications. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, talk, Evan. Now we will move on to the two additional panelists, which will get a somewhat briefer uh, introduction, but we will give them five minutes each, and they both uh, represent the industry. Uh, so I would first like to welcome René Christensen. René Christensen is the Director of Sale and Marketing in Jötulgruppen, where he has worked for more than 20 years. He is also on the company board and in the management team. Jötul is a Norwegian company with more than 150 years of experience producing wood stoves. They have a turnover of 1 billion Norwegian kroners yearly, with a significant portion going to export. Jötul produces their wood stoves in Fredrikstad in Norway. So with that, I would like to welcome René. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a very uh, important topic for us, of course. So I will just bring you through my presentation here. And um, the background uh, on the Clean Burning Act came from 1984, where um, uh, the Norwegian governments had a test in uh, outside of Oslo how the consumers were using the stores back home. And it was done by Isaksen and Weiberg. That was some of the background before the act came into place in 1998. And they found out that uh, Norwegians are using the stoves back home with large particulate emissions because we are spent using them on low uh, air and draft. So that's why the test method came into place in 1998. And the good thing in Norway is that we are testing on four burn rate categories. They don't do that in Europe. That's why we are reducing emissions in Norway and that is not done in Europe. So you know that there's not a test method in Europe. They're coming after us next year, which is good. Uh, for Jotel, this was, of course, uh, a game changer for us uh, because we had to invest a lot in uh, product uh, development, R&D. But looking back now, uh, I must say, without the Norwegian government's demand there, we would have been in big uh, pro problems because today to have the clean burning products in, um, in, uh, in the country that reduces the emissions is... Uh, is the way we have, uh, have survived. So thanks to the Norwegian government here. We have, of course, adopted to the demands. We have invested millions yearly in R&D, uh, research and development to adopt to the demands. We are over 20 people working in, in R&D. We are uh, investing three to 4% of our cost yearly on research and development. And I can tell you that, you know, the demand from the Norwegian government is 10 grams. Uh, it came in 1998, but like cars, you know, things are improving year after year. So the last four or five years, the products we have been produced in the markets is below five grams. And we are launching a new product now called F400 Echo. Uh, maybe it's the worst, most clean burning stove. It's down to 1.5 grams, you know, on, uh, on emissions, which is close to nothing. 
And we will continue to invest to reduce the emissions in the years to come, of course, because we have to be out there and we have to take care of the environment. Uh, this is how they, just to show you, we have four or five people working in the lab all the time, uh, working with emissions to optimize the burn, uh, everything. Uh, so, and we also do, as uh, Rustic said, uh, we are, of course, having a blog on Hygge, but we are also using a lot on how to teach people to use the root store, because as Eivind said, that is a very important way to reduce the emissions. So we teach them how to fire in a more environmentally friendly way, how to build your fire, the quality of the firewood, how to use air vents. We do that on different platforms, so social media, we have short videos, pictures, we have websites, and we have videos on YouTube channel, which is only focusing on how to use the, the wood store. Very important. It's not only Hygge. If you have the, the good uh, firing here, you will reduce the emissions. Very important for us. I just would like to also bring you shortly up to Bergen. Uh, maybe there's a reason that the chief from Stavanger is moving to Bergen because they've really done something about the problem on emissions. Uh, Bergen is, as you know, uh, a city within the mountains. So they have big problems with, um, with uh, emissions from wood stoves. So they hired the Nonsense Center. And the Nonsense Center is an independent nonprofit research foundation conducting basic and applied environmental and climate research. So they found out in 2019, that today's situation uh, with approximately 43,000 non-clean burning stoves and approximately 37,000 clean burning stoves. That was the situation in Bergen in 2019. As you can see here, between four to 6,000 properties are similarly exposed to high air pollution. And as it was said, that is not good for people. I mean, you can die from that. So Bergen community started then uh, changed our program, they took set away 50 million Norwegian crowns, and they gave each uh, in this in, uh, in Bergen commune 5,000 rupees if you replace the old wood stove with a new clean burning stove. They did that in 2019, 2020, and in 2021, um, they predict that when you, if you only have clean burning fireplaces in Bergen, you will have no properties in the municipality that are exposed to high air pollution or particulate matters as a result of wood burning alone. So what Bergen has done, you know, is first have a change our program and then they say no to all wood burning stoves. That is the way to do it if you want to reduce and get rid of the emission problem out there. So um, if you should all look at Bergen. So, and just some figures, um, according to uh, the Norwegian uh, Environmental uh, Directorate, uh, the, the emissions of particulates was in 1998, 48,000 tons. Now it's down to 12,000 tons. So figures shows us that the clean burning stoves is actually good for Norway. So from us, from the industry, we must say that uh, the Norwegian government's uh, demand put in from 1998 has had a good effect. We are working according to it. The good thing is that next year, uh, Europe will follow after us and the focus also on emissions. So it was said that 400,000 people is dying on wood burning in Europe, and that's true because they don't have the Clean Burning Act in, in Europe. So you all know that. But next year, that's coming also. So, um, and that's good for us producing in Norway, of course. So, according to the scientists in Nansen, uh, clean burning source is the way to do it, and also from the statistics. So, wood burning is here to stay, but let's ban the old ones. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, and we are almost uh, at the uh, panel discussion. But before that, I would like to uh, introduce Rune Norsk Bergland. And he represents the Industry Association Norsk Varme, which has members from all parties working with fireplaces. Rune has also been an advisor for JPI Urban Europe. Norsk Varme maintains the position that wood burning is a crucial piece of the total energy picture in Norway. Their goal is to be a unifying organization, both professionally and politically. Norsk Varme is also engaged in the information towards consumer and is involved in the energy and environment debate linked to fireplaces. So welcome to you, Rune. Thanks a lot, um, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to bring light to the discussion. Uh, 
So, um, of course, our approach is why would those are needed? And we could start, we agree, we must get rid of the old stoves, but Norway needs stoves. Uh, and there's a challenge within this field as we see as an organization. There are a lot of presumptions. And also today we are in an area where many presumptions almost also personal are laying ground what then stands out as scientific. And that's a challenge for us. We also wonder, is the PPM labeled with car or wood? Because if you follow the path in Oslo and Stavanger, you can see clearly that emissions are mostly following the traffic paths all year. Those made last year are very much better than those made right after 1998. And we see that the, the Directorate of Environment, uh, Milieu Directorate, have now taken this into their calculations, uh, which then we, where we can see that the potential is, is better and we should consider keeping to the very best models when planning for the future. Um, we find it very unserious to compare traffic deaths with wood burning. That's like we now had a discussion with Corona. We, we should remember that the death tolls in Norway have gone down totally during Corona, not up. Uh, traffic deaths are absolute numbers with people that have a normal health and a long life probability. The number of deaths by emissions is people already at weak health and the numbers are very loosely estimated and often based on European citizens. And we know that the health condition in Europe as an average is much weaker than the one in the Nordics. And then we also should know that the housing structure is different in all of the Nordics. For instance, uh, Sweden have mostly people living in cities it's like comparing the agriculture uh, structure. So let's see here, uh, the facts now for heating, uh, this is the very, very latest number, um, shows that 12% of any energy used to heat Norwegians' homes are from wood burning. Uh, and it's important that StartNet says to sell that on the cold tops, they are to we are totally dependent on bioenergy for Norwegian homes as pe people are not always living in the same um, big houses like in cities. We should also remember that heat pumps, after we got them, the energy consumption in Norway went up. Uh, so there is, a, as we know now, these days we have a very high uh, electrical price that's due to that Norway exports more and we get the European prices. It's uh, not at least because of all the electrical cars, but it's also due to the heat pumps because people keep these on all the time. Some of us live here where you could have different uh, energy solutions, but in Norway, many, many live like this on the countryside where people uh, live with many, many meters uh, from the next house. So you need to have individual heating. And we have this park, which people very often forget, and that's the emergency preparedness. And especially if you live in Oslo, but also in Stavanger, the grid is, you know, uh, down. Um, it, it's not by cables, so it's not that often. But here are facts from NVE. Uh, the power, power failure, of course, more often than people in the big cities notice. Agder and Nulan and smaller grid companies, they have an average of six, six power failures a year. Uh, 30,000 persons in Norway lost their electricity for several days in 2020. Uh, here is the fact, the very latest numbers of how many um, breakouts we had of the electrical grid in Norway. Uh, here is and I understand it's small, but it says how many times a year in 2018 did, did you have cut? And a big, big one like Agder Energy, which is one the number four in Norway, they had 6.2 on average cuts. Uh, and uh, uh, many people were without uh, electricity out on the islands for weeks. So wood burning is the only safe source that always will keep your home warm. And that's also a very, very important part here. And then of course, if you live in Stavanger, which is the, the, has the nicest climate and a beautiful city of Norway, you have a totally different situation than if you are living in Gudbrandsdalen or in Lofoten. So wood burning is here to stay, but let's ban the old ones and go for the nice and new ones. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you for that talk. So now everyone has introduced himself. Uh, and Rune, could you also uh, stop sharing your screen so that we can see Oh, I, I like it so much. I would like yeah, to it's, see it. <laughs> it's a nice picture. No, uh, <laughs> I would like I'm to see everyone's lovely faces. Yes. OK, uh, so okay there. Uh, it still shows here. That that's okay. right. I'll do my worst to stop it. Yeah, you can continue. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it stops, yeah. I promise. <laughs> So uh, I think maybe we should start with the topic that uh, everyone in that has given a uh, presentation today seems to agree upon that old wood stoves are bad and many people don't know how to use them correctly. So um, there's been a lot of focus on switching out old wood stoves. Some municipalities has given um, even some uh, compensation to people that switch and there's been videos teaching people how to use them correctly. But this seems to be uh, a lag or there seems to be very difficult to actually make this happen in practice. So the first question I want the panel to uh, hey, have the take on is that are we doing enough and is the current strategy working as intended? Uh, maybe we could have Harald start and I would like you to all give just be a brief comment so that we have time for more. And then I'll give the others in line uh, time to comment. Well, um, thank you for the presentations, everybody. Interesting. Uh, listening to Jötul, Sintef, and Oskvame, it sounds like a fairy tale. Everything's fixed. We can all go home. You got control of these guys. We can just lean back. I don't think it's that simple. Uh, I think this is not rocket science. It's technology, yes. But if you, even in Stavanger over the last couple of months, okay, it's been special, but we have winter every year here. If you look around and if you smell in any, any street corner in the evenings, you, you know something is wrong and that is not very smart and it's probably health damaging. So it's not going fast enough. So my question is rather, I understand you're happy with the development and in your technology uh, development, you see enormous improvements. We know that and that's great, absolutely great. But this is gonna take a long time. A lot of people are not going to shift their, their burners out. It's going to, they're going to stay there for a long time. Second question, which I think is important to, to raise here is, this uh, defense of uh, the power failure. Well, I'd rather turn it around and say, if the, if the grid is the problem, uh, personally, I lived in this old 100-year-old <clears throat> house in Stavanger for, for, since 1983. We never had, we never had a power cut yet. Um, but if, if the grid is the problem, I think we should fix the grid. More than half of what we pay in electricity bills every month is for renting the grid. And if the power companies can't fix the grid, but instead pay out hundreds of millions, Stavanger municipality owning 44% of Lusa gets over 200, up to 300 million crowns out of Lusa every year. Um, they should rather fix the grid. That's the problem. Not that we need to introduce the log burning, but I'm all for modern log burners, but I am afraid the introduction is not going fast enough. We have a health problem. We have to address it. We cannot just pretend that you guys have fixed it. You haven't. Sorry. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, it seemed like René was quite eager to uh, give his take on if the transition is going fast enough. Uh, mm. Would you want to do that, René? I mean, from the industry, we are doing, of course, uh, what the governments are telling us to do uh, when it comes to development of uh, the new technology. But I mean, I totally agree with the restrict that it's not going fast enough. Uh, but I would like you to then go back to Bergen and look at what Bergen Community is doing, because they have this change up programs for two years now. And as you said, going around in Stavang, you still have the smell. And because that's mainly the reason, because you have a lot of old wood burners in, in Stavang. And uh, of course, there are probably places in Stavanger also where it's not good for uh, people to live. Same as you saw on um, 
a report from Nansen in Bergen, where it was four to 6,000 houses today where it's not uh, call it safe to live because of the wood burning. That's why Bergen community is now having the change our programs for two years. And in 2021 this year, you are not allowed to use the old wood burning stove. And that's the way they have to do it to get rid of it. I mean, we are doing what we can on the technological side. But of course, we have to have help uh, from the governments to, to get out all the old wood burning stoves, which is uh, really the problem here. We will continue to work on reducing the emissions uh, in everything we do here on, uh, on our wood stoves, of course. I can also, also add that in Germany, they are also doing the same. They are uh, banning wood burners year after year that they have to replace. But that is done by the chimney sweep. He comes home to you and said, your, your stove is 20 years old, you're not allowed to use it anymore. You have to buy a new wood burning stove, like more or less the same as in Bergen. But they haven't had any support programs before they do that. Same reasons behind that. Get rid of the old ones and replace it with new ones. And now uh, Susanna was next out. She raised her hand. And yes. just to, to the others, just raise your hand if you want to comment on what was just uh, said. So go ahead, Susanna. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I completely agree with everybody. New technologies are much better. And this is something that uh, we are confident that uh, the emission factors of new uh, stove are much lower. The problem that we observe over time is that how much wood people is using, uh, it does not compensate for the reduction in the, in the emission factor. So we get better and better technology, but the, the wood consumption that people is, uh, the amount of wood that people is burning in a way, it does not correspond to this efficient new stove that we have today. So here today we have experts on, uh, on new technologies and they are right. The, the new stove are better and better and they should emit much less according to all the experiments that are carrying out. We have to see what will happen in real life because as we know, emission factors measuring laboratory and measuring the real world conditions are uh, slightly different. We know from other sectors as well, but it is important to remember that emissions depend on the emission factors and in the amount of wood that people use. And there, the data that is available, of course, with certain uncertainty, because there is always uncertainty on everything, on the emission factor and in the wood consumption, the amount of wood consumption that we have nowadays is too high. So we can keep improving the technology, but if the wood consumption keep at the levels that we are, we don't manage to reduce emissions at the level that are needed. And then also to comment that it's important always to remember that this is a big problem in highly populated areas. For example, I am experiencing uh, also uh, electricity uh, shots uh, in, the, in the cabins, but this is another topic. If do, you have the houses spread in your municipality and there is not people exposed to dangerous levels because of there is not a high population density, this is a different problem. It's not. Uh, and to finalize, I don't want to keep talking. Uh, uh, science is very difficult to, I mean, to interpret the result. Uh, for example, the exercise that was done by Nansen Center, I mean, it's a perfectly valid exercise. But when we take the result and we use it for policymakers or for, yeah, dissemination of for by the industrial sector, it is important to understand how this exercise was done. When you do a modeling exercise, you need to validate the model. And this is done by comparison with real observation. And this was not done in this exercise. In addition, other emitting sources that were not considering. And at the, at the last and very important, emissions were divided by 10. So it does not represent the real emissions. So it was a valid exercise but how you use the results, you need to consider how the exercise was done. And yeah, I just wanted to comment because it comes many times this uh, report that is valid exercise, but it does not answer the questions that we need to answer today. Thank you for that response, Susanna. Do Avon or Rune want to give any comments before we move on to some other topics? Uh, I can comment uh, regarding yes. the wood consumption for in wood stores. It's not increasing in Norway. So <clears throat> that is not increasing the emission levels. I agree. Uh, I didn't say that it's increasing. I said that it's very high levels. That does not correspond with efficiency of the Yeah, stuff. but let me speak now. 
Yes. So it's not increasing and the technology is uh, con continuously improving. So the best wood stores today, they are very good. Uh, banning the old wood stores would help a lot. There are many old wood stores also in Stavanger. So that's clearly a good measure, but it's also about the teaching people how to use the wood stores. This is extremely important. And it can be a factor of five in the difference in emission levels between uh, poor use of the wood store and the appropriate way of using it. So it's also about public education. So a wood store <coughs> is a combustion plant. The challenge is that you are the operator of this quite advanced combustion plant. And this uh, needs proper operation. And this is equally important uh, as actually the new wood store. So if you operate a wood stove correctly and have a new wood stove advanced in addition, the emission levels will go down very much. You will most likely not have the problems in Stavanger that you have today with these uh, peak uh, uh, pollution levels uh, being red uh, for some hours during the afternoon, for example. Exchange the old wood stoves, operate the wood stoves correctly, and the picture will be completely different. Yes, I see we have one more comment from uh, René. I just want to <clears throat> uh, follow up Eivind here because we know that there's a big problem on the use of wood stores out there. So for Norsk Varme, Jötel and uh, also the governments uh, to learn people how to use the wood stores. I mean, people can call our customer service and say that they have had a lockdown in water because they want it to burn longer. I mean, we, we have a challenge here to really learn people how to use the wood store. I think we all agree upon that. And I just want to add one more thing, and that is uh, when we have the cold weather we have today and um, high electricity prices, we know that people are taking back the old wood burners, they are buying spare parts, everything to get the old burners to, to work. So that will increase the emissions from old wood burning stalls. People are calling daily on, on that to our customer service. Yeah, maybe 10 seconds, uh, Halek. Uh, yes, we, we go ahead. That, you know, um, as an organization, we have contacted fin.no to actually let them be aware that it's not allowed to put back old stoves made before 1998, but they're still for sale in Norway, and mm -hmm. uh, Finn will not stop it. Yeah, and yeah, thank you for that comment. So there seems to be some... Yeah, some work to do to get rid of these stoves. So Harald also wanted to comment there. Yeah, I just want to comment uh, or, or ask rather, Sintef, um, uh, you just said that, um, the and we all agree that what people put in a burner, how they burn, I mean, people's homes and is not a laboratory. People do what they like. Hmm. Um, you said there's a fact of five, depending on how you use it. Um, I, I, I agree it's probably in that range, but my question is then, you know, why, why do you all have such a great belief in mankind? Uh, you know, in urban planning, we're working with behavior change all the time. One thing is to introduce new electric cars or make the cities greener, etc. But how do you get people to use the cities in a good way? Uh, how do you nudge people to, to go in a more sustainable direction? This is very complicated stuff. It's not for technologists, it's for psychologists and sociologists. And, uh, but you guys, you seem to have such a belief in uh, that uh, you can kind of just tell people through videos and other things how to burn correctly. I mean, ask people who really go into people's home, ask home nurses and people that actually know what's going on in people's homes. They, they, they can tell you that people are burning whatever they like in, in their log burners. They're not, they're, they're not laboratories like in Sintef. So uh, everything you're saying is great because of course technology is an advance and it will happen sooner or later, but it is not used correctly. And I don't think it's gonna be used correctly tomorrow just because you say so, I'm sorry. Okay, thank I you for that. That, that was yeah, for I, me, right? Yeah, so I yeah. can just, that is perfect because that was actually the question I wanted to ask. So yeah, the question how I raised is, are we doing enough to teach people? And uh, yeah, he asked Evan and also Susanna is afterward. So go ahead, Evan. Yeah. yeah, all technologies, they need uh, proper use. 
So if you have a car, you have a driver license and you drive that uh, car according to the traffic rules. So if you have a stove, yeah, there's a certain way to operate it if you want to reduce the emission levels. This is not fantasy. Uh, and these are facts. This has been proven time after time. It's no problem. You have a lot of information on the internet. That's into the web pages. You have videos. You can click in my presentation and come to videos showing you how you should ignite and how you should maintain the fire uh, during the normal operation after the ignition period. So it's about education. And if the people are unwilling to educate themselves, uh, actually, I'm one of the people myself, right? I have a wood store. I operate it correctly. It's not a problem. It doesn't take much. It's a simple recipe to operate the wood store, and then it's the fuel. If people put waste into the wood store, they are doing something very wrong, of course. So they need to be educated, or something needs to be banned. And that's the old wood stores. But for sure, they can still put waste into a new wood store. Uh, but that is actually uh, people, and they need to be educated, or their, let's say, the store technology needs to become so, so automatic uh, that they cannot do these things. But that's in the future. Thank you for that. Then we go further to have Susanna give us comment, followed by Rene. Uh what I had was a question. It's not concerning uh, um, how people use the stove. Uh, so I can't wait if uh, the, the next comment is about it. I had a, a question that popped up before. Yeah, let's uh, do that at the end. But OK, yeah. go ahead, Rene, with regards to how we teach people to use the stoves correctly. Yeah. Um, again, I will say, if, if you have a car, you don't put water into the tank. It won't, uh, won't work. And it's not very hard to operate uh, a wood store. And I still believe that people are pretty smart out there. So um, to educate them, uh, we have to do that, of course. Like uh, the car industry is learning people to put the right uh, consumption into, into the cars and so forth. And also in other industries. So this is something we have to work with uh, alongside with the technology, of course. So, um, yeah, that is solvable because people are still pretty smart out there. Okay, then we can bring up your question, Susanna. Thanks. Uh, uh, it's a question. I think that the best uh, to help me, to help me in that question is uh, is Sintef. We had uh, visitors from uh, from Denmark uh, last year or two years before COVID, so more than a year ago. Um, they were producing a stove and technologies for reducing emissions, and uh, they provided information. But it was a report. I'm not able to. It's not my comfort zone, but they they claim that the new stove obviously reduces uh, PM 2.5. That is what we are discussing today, and it's the topic because it's a regulated compound. But the new stove were not reducing other compounds that were uh, even more relevant for human health, such as ultra fine particles. Uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, Sintef uh, has uh, any information on in that regards, because uh, this will be more relevant for human health. That, for example, uh, PM 2.5. New stove produce more ultra fine or? Yeah, the stoves reduce uh, <clears throat> yeah, the total particle emission level. It reduces PM10, it reduces uh, PM2.5. You saw the factor of 15 between the nominal load uh, for, uh, <clears throat> for uh, new stoves and the old stoves at uh, part load operation. Uh, the question of the really, really small particles, uh, that's different. It's not included in uh, any test standard. And I think that is a point which requires further work. And the uh, origin of those particles uh, are also different compared to the emissions of unburned. So it's a valid question, but uh, there is still uh, knowledge to be gen generated on that part. So it's not really a topic for this discussion, I think. OK, so we have. One more question before we move into the uh, question from the audience. We have gotten a few, and I see also Torleif has his hand up. But the last question, I think it goes towards Susanna, which uh, was raised, is that how do we actually know which emissions come from which? How do we know that the emissions uh, from wood burning actually is from wood burning and not from other sources? Could you shed some light on that? Uh... For example, if we are talking about a modeling uh, exercise, each source 
each emission source is introduced in the modeling exercise independently. So then we are able to, uh, based on different modeling exercise, to see removing one source or the other, to see the contribution from different sources. And this is also very important to remember because it's wrong to compare boot burning with traffic um, for many aspects. But one of them is that traffic occurs at the ground level. So in our modeling exercise, emissions are introduced in the ground level. That is where we walk, let's say. But wood burning is not introduced in the ground level because it occurs at much higher. So it's not correct to compare. So this is how we do it from a modeling point of view. From a, from a compositional point of view, this is more interesting. However, it's very expensive. You can do a chemical analysis of the composition of the particles and establish tracer and then uh, do um, a source contribution based on chemical analysis. Uh, we tend to talk about PN2.5, PN10, but it is important that people realize that PM is just a box. There is a different composition. The particles that are there, they are completely different. So when the, the particles are coming from cars or they are coming from uh, wood burning or from fires or from industry, they have different chemical composition. So then this is something that is possible to do with a good chemical analysis of the particles. Uh, it is used uh, tracers. Le levoglucosan is one of the compounds that they are used to, uh, to see the contribution from wood burning and also black carbons that we are able to distinguish which part comes from traffic and which part comes from uh, biomass burning. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So with that, we jump on to the question from the audience. And then I see that Torleif Weidal was the first one to raise his hand. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a scientist at uh, NILU in uh, Susanna's group. I would also mention that I've worked at Sintef before and then say hi to Eivin. Um, and I like to uh, burning in, in my wood stove. So and I'm trying to wear all hats here. But um, one one thing I'm it's more, maybe more the, uh, a comment. Um, so so PM two point five um, is mainly a challenge. It's not a yearly challenge. It's not a year average challenge. But the leg legislation we have today is is a year yearly average legislation on PM two point five. So I think that's something that needs to to change in order for. The municipalities and also the industry to to move forward. So maybe more a comment, but I don't know. Maybe someone would like to follow up. Thank you. Any follow up comments to that before we move on to the next one? I guess yeah. that's for policymakers and regulations. So it's not our table, but someone should yeah. look into it. Yes. So uh, the next one that wanted to comment was Gunnar K. Halvorsen. Go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me fine? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a person uh, belonging to a generation that is uh, perhaps not as uh, mentally domesticated, uh, it's hard not to see this as a power grab or a, perhaps a Faustian bargain for people's self-reliance uh, or uh, we are perhaps introducing a single point of failure while paying lip service to environmental concerns. That is a cost and we have to be honest about it. And uh, as to uh, the question uh, regarding power outage that was mentioned, uh, let's uh, remind ourselves that this doomsday clock is indeed uh, as per now set to only 100 seconds to midnight. That's all, thank you. Yeah. Anyone wanting to comment on uh, Gunnar's? Uh... No. Um, yeah, and one thing that I also wanted to highlight, it seems like it's also important to differentiate between using wood stoves as an emergency solution compared to everyday use. So I feel that there's a difference between the debate, what do we do with day-to-day -day use compared to keeping them as uh, backup solutions. Um, but the next question is from Anders in the chat. And he asks quite an interesting question that maybe Rune could shed some light on because I guess he works a lot with uh, politicians. 
So he asked, why is the government dragging its feet if there is a consensus that the old stoves are bad for air quality and health? And he also writes that the example in Germany was interesting. Well, <clears throat> this must be more <laughs> my estimation. Um, but um, we, we have, we have uh, three times we have done really big, big service among people on why do they not, you know, change the wood stove. And then you can say the generation that did this by their own motivation, they have already done so. Then uh, we should never forget that actually there are like 15 to 20% who have a very weak economy they can't afford. And then we have around 15% that are so old that they are too old to uh, change anything in their home at all. Uh, and, but there we see that the minute, you know, an uh, elderly person then moves into a care home, a new generation comes in and then the stove are changed. Um, and then we have around 20, 25% uh, clim climate skeptic in, <laughs> and you know which party they are voting on and they don't believe in this. Um, so it's economy, <clears throat> each demographic and, and uh, people who don't believe in it. Thank you for uh, that. If it, if, it, if it was for the municipalities, they are mostly afraid of coming with you know, a strict law that would make people freeze. So it's more like they do it step by step, but doing it. So Bergen has without doubt being the most brave one who have, you know, a fixed policy that has stayed for years. And that's what we need, you know, we see in the Corona situation that everything are changed every day with a short notice. We need a stable program for it, like we did with the oil heaters. Uh, then there was a comment from Harald on that one. Yeah, a couple of points to which I think the discussion has absolutely lost. Uh, one is the issue of climate neutrality. I suppose none of the uh, cat, none, none of the burners, neither Synthef's uh, laboratory burners or Jotul's products have a CO2 catcher. Uh, so the issue has also to be raised, which I mentioned in my introduction, that uh, there is an international agreement that burning wood is climate neutral, but I'm not so sure if, uh, if that will last forever. Uh, if we didn't burn uh, that much uh, logs, um, the, the CO2 situation would, would probably be better anyway. But it's kind of a consensus here and the environmental organizations agree to that. Anyway, my point is, my second point, and which is the one I would like to ask about is, uh, the, the manufacturers and Sintef, you haven't, you haven't said anything about the internal environment. I mean, mean, we know from cars that the internal environment is sometimes worse than the outdoor. We know that people burn candles in their home that sometimes are quite toxic. Um, we know that people open their burners to fire them, etc. And if they don't ventilate properly, they have an indoor air problem. Uh, are you saying that these new burners are, don't cause any internal uh, air damage anymore? Maybe I can uh, answer. Go ahead. So uh, all stoves, when you open the door, uh, has the potential to let some particles, uh, some uh, unburned gas coming into the room. So the question is uh, uh, connected to several things. It's connected to the building, the ventilation system, uh, the stove itself and also the operator. So if you open the door, for example, extremely fast, you will uh, take uh, smoke and particles <coughs> into the room, right? But you open it uh, in a, another way, it will help. It's also possible to design doors so that you prevent more of this coming into the room. You have done also at Sintef and at the new uh, experiments, measurement campaigns, uh, measuring what's coming into the room both our new stores and uh, old stores. So something is always coming into the room when you open the door. Uh, it depends on in which part of the combustion period you are. If you, if you refill uh, when you still have smoke, for example, and a lot of gas is coming up from the wood, you will get more into the room. 
if you do the refilling of the wood stove uh, correctly, then you will fill new wood logs into the stove on the embers, right? And then before any gases go off from the new fuel, you will not cause any gas or particles coming into, into the room. I think uh, a lot can be done on that side just by uh, taking care of the ventilation system. Don't have the kitchen fan running, uh, for example, when you are uh, opening the store door and so on. So there are several issues or things you can do uh, in principle by yourself to reduce this. And it has a lot to do with education and proper operation. But do you seriously think people know this? Well, they smell it. So if you smell it, something is coming into the room. And if you smell it so much, or if you get it in your eyes, then you should, as a user, react. Right. That's quite obvious. So yes, I think they can. And if they're made aware of this, yes, for sure. And if they smell it, they think it's hygge, so they don't mind. Mm. But, but well, I see there was a comment uh, from uh, Rune before yeah, we go I, into I, that. I, I totally agree with uh, Röstvik that, of course, this is a challenge. And uh, I think we are all in the same boat that this is something we need to educate uh, people about. I mean, parents uh, smoked in the front seat of the cars uh, in the earlier days and thought that was uh, just OK. So we are not at all done with the education. That's a challenge we as an industry need to take. I see there's two more questions in the chat that uh, I would like to raise. The first one is from Christina and she asks, so I have previously asked my municipality if they would consider becoming a log burning free commune and their answer was negative. Do the municipalities have any incentive for becoming a trial municipality or similar to at least remove the unhealthy wood burning ovens? Or will the burden be on the households to change their heating sources and habits? Anyone has some input to Christina's question? If nobody else, I my experience with municipalities, I, I'm also an architect, so I have a long life behind me as in practice working with different municipalities. The wood burning thing is not on the agenda. And you see, they don't turn up here even. I'm, Helic knows how many we tried. Uh, it's not on the agenda. They don't care. They think it's traffic that's the problem. Uh, so the fact that we had this discussion today and that the papers are actually covering this is, is big news. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a problem that municipalities don't care about the air quality in winter. Sorry, it is a big problem. One comment from René, who was first raised his hand, followed by Eivind. Uh, just a comment to that, because uh, we are working all over Europe on this. And uh, I must say the only communes or municipalities in Europe who is having support programs to take out the old wood burners is in Norway. We've seen it in Fredrikstad. We've seen, we see it in Bergen now. We've seen it in Stavanger, in Oslo. So the communities, they do care. But if they do enough, that's not a question, but at least the only country in the world is really doing something uh, in the municipalities is in Norway. So, um, yeah, so they, they, they care. And as somebody said also earlier, it's that we are also um, supervised uh, by, by EU on how much emissions each uh, community can, can let out. So they have to care and they have to follow up. Thank you for that comment. Avon, you were next. Yeah, I agree with uh, René here. So the communities care and Bergen is one perfect example of that, I think. So uh, maybe something special in Stavanger, I don't know, but uh, for sure they should have been part of this discussion. It's about uh, uh, Stavanger Kommune in principle, and especially the city parts of it. So they do care, uh, but it's also politics, this. So there's a lot of home owners here with the wood stores and those are also voters in principle. Mm. So it's uh, politics also involved in this. Yeah. Exactly. So I've, uh, we are running towards the end and I don't want to go much over time. Did you Susanna have a last comment before we round things off? Uh, 
has been said by Rene and Oilin. Yeah. Uh, I agree with them. Uh, we work very close to uh, municipalities um, and also with the person, in, with the people in charge of the environmental issue at urban area, not only in Oslo, several Norwegian municipalities, and there is a concern, especially uh, nowadays when traffic has been, um, the emission from traffic has been reduced enormously, especially with the new technology, new Euro 6, uh, new, the, the amount of uh, electric vehicles that we have. There is a still concern uh, in the PM10 part, but boot burning is, uh, is a priority on the agenda. Uh, how much they can do, this is not my comfort zone, but there is a concern in Norwegian municipalities concerning wood burning, yes. Okay, thank you for that last comment. So with that, I would like to thank everyone here showing up today. At least I myself have learned a lot more about wood burning, and I will also go online to check that I'm actually doing my wood log burning correctly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I know that there's uh, journalists in the audience, so I hope that this is something that will be put more focus on in the future. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for coming here today and have a nice, nice uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.